runs at 20 meters a minute without getting tired. It lives longer, has more sex, eats more without gaining weight. Could the science that created this be applied to humans? Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> They're telling us it's in our face. You know, we are an ancient addicted to pills. Not because we want to be addicted, but because the pharmaceutical industry needs us to be addicted. It's critical. Big Pharma has a very, very simple philosophy. From the moment a life form is conceived until that life form deceases, it is a revenue stream. From conception to death. What is interesting in this book, The Corporate Crime, the, the guy, uh, John Braithwaite, uh, actually tries to understand the mentality. Because it actually rocks him that the people he's talking to, the people he's interviewing, all seem like nice family men. Individually. And I'm sure Joseph Mengele was a lovely guy. But collectively, collectively, these guys take on a completely different persona. There is not a, an ounce of humanity in their agenda. There's not an ounce of compassion. It is totally about profits. It's a bit like the American military trying to find ways to kill people remotely. You know, if you can remove the face-to-face -face contact, it's a lot easier to get people to do things that they wouldn't do if they can actually look in the, the whites of the eyes of the, uh, the individual. So, Codex. Codex is a very, very complex structure, and I mean, this is just sort of an introduction. But Codex consists of 27 different committees looking at a whole bunch of different aspects associated with the entire food chain. And you can, uh, you can look at this yourself. I will give you some websites later on to look at it. But there's two particular committees that really impact on everything else. And that is these two here. And this is the nutrition and foods for special dietary uses, which is um, uh, hosted by Germany, and food labeling, hosted by Canada. Now, these two committees impact on all of the others put together. And so, when I talk about um, Codex, in most cases, I'm talking about these two committees. Because it's these two committees that are really setting the trend for where we're going on moving away from the choice of organic food and away from the choice of uh, natural, complementary and natural health care. This statement, and, and you have to forgive me for using the quote because this guy is a lawyer, so um, you know, he, he has to use a hundred words when you know, probably two would do. But this is, I think, a pretty good summary of the whole thing. He says, Codex is the political equivalent of the current toxicology manuals because it endorses and promotes for international trade and consumption in the whole wide world everything from pesticides to irradiation, genetically engineered foods and synthetic analogues for drugs and nutrients in preference to biocompatible natural substances. Now, what we're talking about here is the process of gradualism. So, you know, if somebody says to you, oh, organic food, we're still going to have access to organic food in 2010, they're probably right. They're probably right. But if somebody says, oh, we're still going to have organic food in 2020, right now I would say they're probably wrong. Because this is the process of gradualism, and what the Codex committees do because they're under phenomenal pressure from the uh, pharmaceutical companies and the likes of Monsanto, they do it through gradualism. So it's little by little, push a little. And then every now and again they'll give a little, so they take your eye off the ball. I mean, as in France recently. You know, in France, they said, OK, you know, and what was announced in the media is the number of acres dedicated to organic farming would increase. And that was what hit the media. What they didn't say was that the number of acres that was going to um, be handed over to GM crops was going to increase at three times the rate. You have to find what's not written. So, 
Codex was actually started in 1962, and I'm quite prepared to believe that the, the people who originally dreamed up the concept were you know, erring on the side of benevolence. It was only after the likes of Monsanto and the likes of the pharmaceutical industry saw the potential for reaping the benefits of Codex that they started to get in on board here. And of course, what we're talking about here is organisations that have basically bottomless pockets. Now bear in mind, I said in 2002, the profitability of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies exceeded the profitability of the other 490 companies in the Fortune 500. Now the, these guys have got people, teams of people, working on strategies to maximise the opportunities brought about by the implementation of Codex Alimentarius. I mean, this, I'm going to show you, this is a real David and Goliath situation. And I wouldn't be here tonight if I didn't think that David had a chance. I think David's got more than a chance, but there's a lot of groundwork to do to really give, that, give David the chance. Codex serves the economic interests of Big Pharma. And what is really a concern is that the World Trade Organization will implement Codex using Napoleonic law. Now, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's hardly anybody in the room who knows what Napoleonic law is, because it's something that hasn't existed in the UK since 1215. Because in the UK, since the Magna Carta, we've had common law. And what common law is, is that if something, unless something is specifically banned, it's okay. Right? So unless something is specifically mentioned in a piece of legislation to outlaw it, it's okay. Napoleonic law is completely the opposite. Unless something is specifically mentioned, it's banned. And the way the pharmaceutical companies work and the way the food companies work is what they're trying to do with the Codex Committees is make the testing process so outrageous and outrageously expensive that the only people that can afford to get things on the approved list will be the Monsantos and the pharmaceutical companies. Nobody else will be able to afford to go through the rigorous tests that you have to go through to get a product onto the approved list. I mean, this is outrageous. It's completely outrageous. They nearly got away with this in the US in 1994. Now, I was actually uh, living in the US at the time, and I didn't appreciate the significance of it, but um, you know, I was aware that sort of people were hitting the streets big time, and they were always rallying at the Whole Foods stores. Well, right across the US, hundreds of thousands, probably millions total, got hit, uh, people hit the streets, and they were protesting against the implementation of Codex Alimentarius. And it was kept out of the international media. In fact, it was kept out of the limited national US media. It was only reported on a local basis. So the people in Texas who were protesting actually didn't realize the people in all the rest in the other cities around the states were also protesting. But people were writing to their senators, and eventually the Senate realized that actually there was such a groundswell of opinion here, they needed to do something about it. So this legislation, the Deshaies legislation, which is the Dietary Supplement uh, Health Education Act, was implemented in 1994. And this effectively put a ring fence around the, uh, the health food and complementary health and um, alternative therapy industries in the US. So what did the Codex Commission do? Just go, damn. Okay, let's turn our attention to Europe. So for the last 13 years, they've been, you know, trying to eat away at the protectionism of the individual countries within the European states. They've been working on the basis that none of the European countries talk to each other, which they're right about. The British government has washed its hands of this. So, I mean, you should write to your MP, as I will talk about it later. But the British government has completely washed its hands of this. The British government has said, we'll just do whatever we're told to do by the EU. Okay? Which is basically what has to happen anyway. Because the EU issues two things, directives and regulation. And if they issue a regulation, basically that is law. If they issue a directive, what they're saying is, look, okay, it doesn't have to be law right now. We're going to let you go through the charade of making it look like you're making the decision. But you have to actually implement the legislation. All the privatisation that's going on, it's not this government making the decision to privatise the industries. It's like the German government's not making the decision to um, privatise uh, the Dutch railway system or the French making the decision. It's EU directive that's coming down the chain. 
If you don't, uh, there's some brochures at the back here on the EU, and uh, I mean, it does actually try and spell.